Well, good evening and welcome. I want to thank you, um, those of you who've been watching and, and tuning in weekly to this little this little series, sort of an unofficial series. It's um, uh, one of the oddest ones I've done, I think, here. I'd certainly the oddest one I've done here on this Tuesday meeting is just a, a series that really rotates around single-use words from the Greek New Testament. It's not the kind of series that uh, is a head turner. Um, I got into this because th these kind of things kind of fascinate me. Um, hey, Paxes, the, the usage of a, of a word one time within a body of work. I, that, to me, that's interesting, but that's certainly not anything that makes a theological difference. Um, and I'm not try, I've not tried to twist it into making one, but what it has done every week is, is caused me to think a little differently. When we're doing books, Ephesians, John, whatever, um, I, I try to treat them chronological for the most part. What's, what's next? Like, what's the next verse? And what's that next verse want to say? And how many of them do I want to try to cover? And with this, it's not that way. It's jumping all around and looking at different words to see if the word maybe was, was translated in a way that made it more difficult or if it could have been better. Um, some of these have been fascinating to me. Some of them have been important to me in my own journey. They've expanded the way I've interpreted Scripture. They've helped me with passages that were troublesome. Um, for instance, I, I, mean, I didn't mean to do this, but um, for instance, the, the very first one we did, give us this day our daily bread, and the fact that that word is better translated tomorrow, um, that, that, that helped me with the Lord's Prayer. It helped settle my spirit on some things. Um, our, our message from James on the double-minded man and what it means in context um, is not just someone who thinks about two different things, because <laughs> um, I think about 12 different things about half the time in my life. Like, well, I'm not just double-minded. Uh, you know, I'm about, it's about as split as it can get. But just to realize that James is saying something else, he's trying to show that God is singular in the way he treats you, the way he thinks of you, and that he's encouraging you to be singular in the way that you think of him. Well, that helps, man. That, that doesn't accomplish everything, but it accomplishes something. So some of these have been that way. Others have just been vehicles. They've just been for fun. They've just been the word that helped us to have something to talk about in a greater story inside of that text. Um, and, and I've, but I've, I've had fun with all of them. Tonight is one that I've sat on for this entire series because I've used this word on you guys before. We've studied tonight's word. Tonight's subtitle is the restoration of all things. Um, and restoration of all things is a concept that is surprisingly controversial. The word I want to use tonight is a word that has caused more controversy inside of Christianity, not from the outside in, but just within the confines of Christianity, than probably any hapax that we will talk about. And so much so that we've had severe divisions in the way the church fathers up through the century saw this word, where this word went doctrinally, and even to this day, it's one of the most vitriolic um, statements that one can make, is that there will ultimately be a restoration of all things. It's one of the most divisive things that you can say because people try to put you into a theological camp based upon how you see tonight's hapax a word that appears one time in the New Testament, but I would argue that the spirit behind this word appears all throughout the New Testament consistently. It just happens to be that only one writer ever bothered to codify it all into one singular word, and they borrowed a word. Tonight's hapax existed in secular literature, but they borrowed it and the great argument is, what did they mean by it? So that's what we want to get down to tonight. I'm not trying to give you the answer tonight. Because how can I give an answer to something people have been fighting about for 2,000 years in the church? I can't land my foot on what you should think about this. But I do want to try to at least give some of the supporting text. Here's the body. Here's the slice of the story. We're going to read the bigger body of the story in a minute. Here's a small slice of the story. It's Peter and, ja and John coming into the Temple Mount through the Gate Beautiful. It's called the Beautiful Gate. There's all kinds of gates that go into the Temple Mount. They come through the Beautiful Gate, 
and they encounter a man who is lame. Um, Peter, silver and gold have I none, what I have I give to thee. In the name of Jesus of Nazareth, rise, take up your bed and walk. Man rises and walks. And there is a, an amazing amount of chaos that ensues. This is the repeat of the things Jesus was doing. And here's Peter and John, two of his most famous disciples, doing it. We're only in Acts 3, by the way, so we're not deep into the history of the church yet. This is very, they're very young. There's, been, there's not even been but one sermon preached in the book of Acts, and it was Peter's sermon at Pentecost, an unrehearsed sermon, off the cuff. And then in Acts 3, we get another sermon. We get Peter, who has had a little bit of time to think about things, and now throws out a sermon that, for my money, is one of the, one of the best, especially considering that he didn't have anybody else to pull from. Like, he hasn't ever heard Paul. Paul's not even saved yet. So he's not pulling from a Pauline theology. He's heard Jesus, of course, but now he's full of the Holy Spirit. And he gives this message, and he drops a word into the vernacular that is the source of what we want to talk about. Let's jump into the center of it. This is the heartbeat of it. I will also tell you this is both the first and the last screen in tonight's lesson. Um, I don't mean we won't have more. This is the first screen we'll use, and we'll use it again at the end because we're going to bookend this lesson around these three verses. Everything in between is to really support this thought. Peter says this, Repent therefore and be converted, beginning in verse 19, for those listening, not watching. Acts 3.19, Repent therefore and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. That alone is a beautiful verse. And that he may send Jesus Christ, who was preached to you before. And then here it is, 21. Whom heaven must receive until the times of restoration of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. The word is restoration. The Greek word, apokatastasis. I've used this word on you 50 or 100 times in the, in the past few years. Apocatastasis, one of my favorite Greek words, because, maybe because it is so unique, but I think more so not just that it sounds cool, because I do think it sounds cool, but because of what it means and what it insinuates. It actually is defined as to put back again or to set in order. Peter borrows this word. It's used in secular literature for hundreds of years before Peter. Its most prominent use is in Astronomy. Apocatastasis was the Greek word for when the planets came back to where they started on their annual journey around the sun. So like you and I look at our calendar and we know that one year from right now, our planet will be right back to where it is now on its journey around the sun. Technically, it will be where it is now, but it will be a slightly further into the Milky Way because the entire thing is moving that took a long time for astronomers to realize, but you get the point. The Greek for that would be apokatastasis. It would be the return of the planet to where it started. It goes back to the beginning. You put it back again to set the whole thing back in order. And you get, like having the, the planets and the sun in your astronomy lesson, and you got them all in the little wires, and you're moving the earth, the little styrofoam ball, you painted it blue, and you're moving it around the big sun, and all this, and then you reset them, you put them back where they started, you apocatastasis. No one would say that, but the Greeks would have. You put them back in order. You put it back to the place that it began. So Peter takes a word that's popular. It's not, a, it's not like he makes it up, but no one would have, have, has ever used it this way, to use it spiritually, to say that God will put things back to the way they started. That God, through Jesus Christ, will set them back in place. He will put it back the way it's supposed to be. It's the only New Testament usage of a word so controversial that it led the Second Council of Constantinople. The Second Council meets in the middle of the 6th century, 553 AD. It leads them to vote and come to a declaration that come to a decree rather that the doctrine of apocatastasis was heretical because by the mid-6th century, 
This had codified into what they considered the doctrine of apocatastasis. And the doctrine of apocatastasis was pushed pretty heavily in the early formative years, second century, up into fourth century, guys like Origen, uh, Gregory of Nyssa, Eusebius, some of the great early thinkers of church history were writing treatises in defense of this thing, this word, this singular word in the New Testament, apocatastasis, and they were taking it out of Acts 3.21, not taking it out as in it wasn't there. They were lifting it and they were using it as an interpretive lens on various texts throughout the New Testament. So they were taking Peter's word that Peter had borrowed, apocatastasis, and they were using Paul's writings and James's writings and others from the New Testament, and they were looking at those verses through the lens of what if these verses mean that God is going to set everything back in order, and that's what these verses are trying to say. And that begin to gain steam over the first, we're talking half a millennium of church history. It begins to gain steam, but it's not universally understood that way. Uh, what happens is that it begins to drift. The understanding of apocatastasis begins to drift into Universal reconciliation, the idea that at what it means to say that God will restore all things is to say that God will save all in the end. And that's where the great division begins to happen, that by the middle of the 6th century, we they have to have a council to go, is this the way we're going to preach the end? Because apocatastasis has eschatological implications. There's no way it doesn't. And if... It does, then what does that mean for end times? What does that mean for the end of it all? What does it mean of where this all comes down? And you can see how this is a big deal because if you see apocatastasis to mean that God will restore all things and all people and he will bring this whole thing back to a state of perfection, then that, of course, becomes the heartbeat of your eschatological journey. That what we're doing is not going down into destruction, but rather heading upward towards this place. It's, it all sort of hinges, and they see this early in the church. They see that this is the source of so much debate. So the real division then comes, do we want to stand with a doctrine of apocatastasis as in everyone ultimately is reconciled to God? Or do we want to call that word, say that apocatastasis is simply Peter's way of saying that in the end, God is going to do what God is going to do. And that we have a response to what God is going to do. And then, of course, they could list off a body of scriptures that appear to say that... Um, Maybe people will burn forever. Uh, people are not able to be saved after they're dead. This is where the great division happens. That's still alive and well today. However, I never even heard for most of my life that there was any other kind of gospel than all of you are going to hell and Jesus died on the cross so that you don't have to. And if you'll accept Jesus as your savior, you can go to heaven, and if you die without accepting him as your savior, you will automatically go to hell. To me, that was the gospel. The good news was that you didn't have to go to hell. That was the good news. And that if you would accept Christ, you would be saved. And of course, you paint yourself into a corner because you've got all kinds of people dying without having made a profession of faith. And some of them are teenagers, and some of them are little kids. And some of them are in lands that never heard the gospel. And so we then have to start deciding, does that really mean that everybody goes to hell? Because if it really means that everybody goes to hell, then yes, the little baby went to hell. And yes, teenage kid that, that got drunk and crossed the center lane, hit someone head on and died. Yes, they went to hell. And the guy over there in that country that's never heard the gospel. Yes, they go to hell. And that was the only way I knew the gospel. And, and so revelations of the love of God have begun to sway me to listen to the gospel, not through the lens of, hey, the good news is 
you don't have to go to hell, but rather to listen to the possibility that the gospel is, hey, good news, Jesus has reformed the world and is making it into his image. And I still find myself vacillating because all I've known for so long is one way and, and then I'm introduced to the idea of a loving God who gives me the revelation of his love in such a powerful way to say, what if? And so all I want to present to you tonight is I want to present apocatastasis as it was argued for five centuries in the church. And it doesn't mean it was right, but it also has to be relevant <laughs> for those of us who never heard it argued that way. It at least has to be considered. And I know that just because the church fathers thought something doesn't mean we have to follow it. Martin Luther, if we followed everything Martin Luther taught, well, we would most certainly be anti-Semitic. Because you can't get around it in his work. And I don't mean like shadow anti-Semitic. I mean straight up, they should die anti-Semitic if we follow the teaching long enough. So I, I certainly don't <laughs> ever want to say that we, we pick church fathers or we pick reformers and then we all just follow what they said because they had great insight. That's a terrible idea for any of us in any era, because we're not disciples of Origen or Augustine or Eusebius or Gregory or Martin Luther or John Calvin or name your favorite TV preacher. We're not disciples of that. They're just people. That doesn't mean they're always wrong and it doesn't, it certainly doesn't mean they're always right. But it does mean that there's a lot of things to say. And so all I've ever asked you to do is be good listeners and good wrestlers. And at the end of the day, if you don't land on a certain spot, fine. And if you don't land with me, fine. What we're looking for is Christ and trying to be impacted by the, the, the image of God that we see through Jesus. So let me give you some new... These are some of the verses that the early church fathers took the word apocatastasis and they used it to filter those verses, okay? Here they are. Here's some of them. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. This is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior who desires all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. All, what I'm asking you to do is consider that if apocatastasis means the recreation of all things, the setting back in order, then you can see how the following verses can be interpreted through a lens that if Peter's right in Acts 3.21, and if he means what it sounds like he means, then verses like this would mean that God's will is for all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. You can conversely flip that argument, because we can always do this and go, well, God doesn't get what he wants. God wills for all people to be saved, but maybe not all people will be saved. See how you can argue this? This is not hard to do. We've been doing this forever with the scriptures. At the end, we're not landing on, we're not always landing on definitive answers. This is why the act, as far as I'm concerned, the actual lens by which we read the word is Jesus. So watch how Jesus does it. And if it sounds like Jesus, then maybe you're on the right track. If it doesn't sound like Jesus, you're not. And so which one sounds like Jesus? The restoration of all things, meaning that he wills for all men to be saved and they will. Or the restoration of all things, meaning he wishes all men will be saved, but they won't. You put it in black and white terms like that, you, it's up to you to deal with. Okay, you need more? Of course you do. Why wouldn't we? And there's more. Ephesians 1, 9 and 10. He made known to us the mystery of his will. Okay, will. Remember in the previous verse, he wants everybody to be saved. So here's his will. According to his good pleasure which he purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of the times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth in him. Oh, well, his will then, because remember in 1 Timothy 2, he wills that everybody gets saved. And our converse argument is, well, just because he wills it doesn't mean everybody will. Okay, well, 
Paul, in his Ephesians letter, says the mystery of God's will is that it's God's good pleasure that in the disposition of the fullness of times, not just now, but way out there, when this is all fully done, that in the dispensation of the fullness of time, he gathers together in one all things in Christ, both the things which are in heaven and which are on earth. That's God's will, according to Paul. God's will is that when it's all over with, he gathers everything into himself. Counter-argument, God doesn't always get what he wants. Right? That's, that's the best counter-argument I got. God wills to gather all things into heaven and earth. He doesn't always get what he wants. You see how you can push against, push, and this is what, and I've done this forever with scriptures. So you can push against with a thought. Sometimes we have to let all of our thoughts come into the obedience of Christ. And I think what that means is not just watch what you think about, but allow your thoughts to start to come into the way that Christ thinks. And that's the lifelong journey of the believer. Okay? How about some more? Colossians 1, 19 and 20. It pleased the Father that in Him all fullness should dwell. And by Him to reconcile all things to Himself. By Christ, whether they're things on earth or they're things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross. So the cross is the fulcrum by which peace has been blanket cast into everything in heaven and everything on earth. And it pleases God to reconcile everything, everything where? Everything in heaven and everything on earth to himself through the cross, that the cross becomes the keyhole by which God sends his love out. You see it go through the cross beams, that the love goes out to the world, but it can only happen because he takes into himself the violence of the world. We're coming up on Easter. It's Christ stepping into the violence of the world. He faces it. And, and all men before him face violence and return fire with fire. Because that's what the first Adam does. That's the reciprocated, reciprocal violence. It's that circular bloodshed jesus then steps into the cross takes it into himself takes upon himself death and pain and so that out of that so then resurrection jesus can paul would say in second corinthians 5 god reconcile the world back to himself by not counting their sins against them so we can see them in christ so we don't have to see them in us that's reconciliation counter argument second corinthians 5 be you reconciled to god Okay, so God did the work. We have a role to reconcile ourselves to God. The great question that Apocatastasis tries to answer is, what happens if you don't reconcile yourself to God? What happens if you die having not reconciled yourself to God? One argument is, you go to a hell that immediately burns you up and you're gone forever, called annihilation. Another argument is, you go to a hell where you burn forever and forever because that's what you deserve. And another argument is that you go to hell and that that hell is the restorative fire and it burns out what doesn't belong so that the fire can restore you to where you need to go. And all of these have been argued and argued and argued and argued throughout the history of Christianity. Paul's not trying that argument. As far as I can see, he's just saying that it pleased the Father to reconcile it to himself whether it's in heaven or on earth and he did it through the cross. Paul doesn't even take up the argument about what happens when you die. For him, it sounds as if he's way beyond that. His Ephesians argument was that in the fullness of dispensations that he's going to do this. And so this is why for hundreds of years, the doctrine of apocatastasis picked these verses up and said, isn't this what Paul's saying? Or how about this one? This was the verse, by the way, that used apocatastasis. In their, they used this one more than any in their writings. Romans 8, 21, I'll give you the lead in verse. 20, the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. Because the creation itself, look at 21, creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. This was the primary verse that the early fathers wrote and used Peter's apocatastasis to interpret this verse, to say that the creation 
is going to be restored to a state of liberty. That's where Adam was in the garden. Prior to the fall, perfect liberty, all of creation, apocatastasis, taking us, starting the planets over again, right? Moving everything back to the Garden of Eden. And they would use Paul's Romans 8.21 argument. One of my personal favorites is James 2.13. Judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. And almost like a counter argument, James says, mercy triumphs over judgment. Statement of fact or statement of if you want to accept it. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Does mercy triumph over judgment? Or is it mercy triumphs over judgment if you want to receive mercy? Or is it some combination of both? I'm not answering that question for you. I'm throwing out the questions that puzzled the church for so very long. Let me give you a Eusebius writing. This is fourth century. One of the great proponents of apocatastasis. This is Eusebius from the fourth century. The expression until the times of restoration. That's our text from Acts 3.21. That expression indicates to us the world to come in which all beings must receive the perfect restoration. On the occasion of the restoration of all beings, creation itself will be transformed. There's Romans 8.21. From the slavery of corruption to the freedom of the glory of the children of God. This was his interpretation of Paul's 8th chapter of Romans, saying that on that occasion... Creation has to be restored. But also, all beings must receive the perfect restoration. Now, I want you to put that on hold for a minute. <laughs> That's a lot to put on hold. Apocatastasis. Put on hold what the early church thought it meant. Put on hold the fact that we've been fighting over this ever since. Uh, will there be an ultimate reconciliation of all things? Some of your translations, by the way, are getting bold. Finally, and Acts 3.21, heaven must receive until the times of restoration. Some of your translations now read, heaven must receive until the time of ultimate reconciliation. Because that's as close as we can get to what that word meant 2,000 years ago. Now, the implications of what does that mean for us, I think, is the great challenge. Um, I'm, I'm, I want to put that on hold for a second because here's what I want to do. I want to take you back to the story. I want to drop it into the middle of what Peter's trying to do. I want to take you past the story into what Peter's going to do next. And I want to show you that we're all, this whole thing is part of a greater narrative that I think Peter got first. Take it, please take it more serious than I used to. <laughs> Whenever Jesus says to Peter, I'm going to give you the keys to the kingdom. Okay. Because I looked past that for a long time and I thought, well, what Jesus ultimately meant is He's going to give all of us the keys of the kingdom. And I don't doubt that. But I think the early disciples would have taken it pretty personal when Jesus looked at Peter and said, I'm going to give you something that's a key to the kingdom. And they would have thought, we ought to listen to Peter. So Acts 3 and Acts 4 is Peter doing his thing, like, like laying out the key to the kingdom the best that he can. And he not only ever does it better. In all of Paul's writings, he, doesn't, he, he expands on this, but maybe never any better than what Peter does. Let's read the story, and we'll jump in with a little Jesus. We'll come back to the story. Uh, let's start in Acts 3.11. As the lame man who was healed held on to Peter and John, all the people ran together them, to them in the porch, which is called Solomon's, and they were greatly amazed. When Peter saw it, he responded to the people. Men of Israel, why do you marvel at this? Why, why do you look so intently at us? As though by our own power or godliness we made this man walk. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, glorified His servant Jesus, whom you delivered up and denied in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. But you denied the Holy One and the just, and you asked for a murderer to be granted to you. This is the Barabbas moment. And you killed the Prince of Life, whom God raised from the dead, of which we are witnesses. Okay. So Peter's, this is our first glimpse as to what Peter thought of the cross. 
He doesn't say anything about Jesus dying for our sins. He doesn't say anything, not yet. He doesn't say anything about Jesus taking into himself wrath, Jesus conquering the devil, nothing. At this point, it's simply, God gave us Jesus and you killed him. And Pilate was ready to let him go, but you didn't want to let him go. You killed him. And this is a heavy accusation. And you killed the Prince of Life. But Peter heard Jesus talk about his death before his death. He heard him say this in John 8, 44. Jesus says to the leaders of Israel, You are of your father the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning. And he does not stand in the truth because there's no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources. For he's a liar and he's the father of it. Okay, I bring this up because Jesus accuses those who are going to kill him of killing him because it's the only thing they know to do. They're doing what their system taught them to do. You're going to kill because you're of your father, the devil. But don't think Jesus is pointing them out, not you. This is crucial right here. It's easy for us to think, ah, those murderers. And this is what's caused a lot of anti-Semitism in the world. Go, those Jews that killed Jesus. And there's even prophetic voices, futurist prophetic voices that say, Jesus is going to come back and pour out wrath in the Middle East against the, the bloodline of the people that killed him 2,000 years ago. But that's the response or some other perversion of that word. But when Jesus is talking about your father, a murderer from the beginning, don't think he means just those who put him on the cross. He's talking about the entire system. This entire system is murderous. All it wants to do is kill. It just wants to enact vengeance. You're of your father who wants to do the, you, this is in your bloodline. This is in all of us. This isn't just them. This is in each and every one of us. This is an important aspect of this. Now go back to Peter. Next verse, Acts 3.16. In his name. Through faith in his name, he made this man strong whom you see and know. Yes, the faith which comes through him has given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. And now, brethren, I know that you did it in ignorance, as did also your rulers. But those things which God foretold by the mouth of all his prophets that the Christ would suffer, he has thus fulfilled. Okay, so you did it in ignorance, which is exactly what we all do. We function in this system in ignorance. We function in the system of this world in ignorance. Now watch Peter interpret his own sermon. The next day, he gets arrested for this. He gets called in front of the Sanhedrin. And when he's standing in front of them, he gives an account of the man he's just healed. And he says this in Acts 4, next chapter, 10th verse. Let it be known to you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, he, he doubles down. This is what he said yesterday. He says it again. By him this man stands here before you whole. Now, here's his interpretation. This is the stone which was rejected by you builders, which has become the chief cornerstone. Nor is there salvation in any other, for there's no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. So for Peter, he presents Jesus as a brand new cornerstone. Jesus as a Brand new way of living this life. I want you to remember what Jesus said in John 8. You're going to kill me because you're of your father the devil. He's a murderer from the beginning, and that's what you're going to do. Jesus then steps into death and becomes the chief cornerstone, even though he was a stone rejected by the builders. If you're building something, and they bring a stone to you for the cornerstone, and you reject it, you don't deem it capable of holding up what you're building. So what Jesus was offering was considered a weak stone on the foundations of the earth. We don't want that. That won't hold up what we're trying to do. So I want to ask you, what was the world doing that Jesus pro provides a counter to? That by his very existence, he looks like the opposite of. Remember, he said, you're of your father. He's a murderer. All you want to do is murder. Jesus then steps into their murder. He voluntarily goes to the cross. He can pull himself off the cross, but he doesn't. He steps into death so that by death, he can be transformed into the very thing that you can pin your hopes to, that you can build upon. So Jesus is the cornerstone of a new world. 
built upon the love of God as expressed in the crucifixion. The old world was built on death. The old world was built on vengeance. The old system is built on death and vengeance and hate. But Jesus was presenting a brand new world. Jesus, the one that we rejected, is becoming the cornerstone, the one by whom we construct, we see constructed a brand new way of living. This is why when we're invited to follow Jesus, we're invited to come follow him into his death. We're invited to step in to the sacrificial death of Christ so that we can resurrect into a newness of life. This is our invitation. It's what we're being called to do. Now I want you to think about that as we go back to where we started. So Peter sums it up. Last screen, same as the first screen. Acts 3.19. Change your mind, therefore. Why? Change your mind. You got a new cornerstone, man. There's a new way of doing things. There's a new sheriff in town. We're building something new here. It's never, the world's never seen this before. Change your mind, therefore, and be converted. Come over to a new way of doing things. That's conversion. That your sins may be blotted out. So that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord and that He may send Jesus Christ who was preached to you before whom heaven must receive until the times of restoration of all things which God has spoken by the mouth of all His holy prophets since the world began. So Peter drops a new word in. I don't know why Peter does it. I don't know if Peter's thinking please repent and be converted so that God can bring apocatastasis. Because if you're repent and if you're converted, then he makes your, things, your, your world new. But personally, I think it's the most shallow way to land on what Peter says. The broadest possible way to land on it is, change your mind. God is good. Receive forgiveness of sins. Jesus is going to do this work until he restores all things. Wouldn't you like to get in on it now? And I admit that's pretty broad. It's so broad that it scared the Council of Constantinople in the middle of the 6th century. Because their thought process was, what if people actually believe that? What if people actually believe that everything will be restored? The fear is that if you actually believe that apocatastasis means all things get restored, you will only accept verse 21 and you'll reject verse 19. This is the fear, even to this day, that if apocatastasis means everything gets put back in its right place, then the only thing people will do is hold on to the hope of apocatastasis and they won't repent and they won't convert their life and they won't live as if their sins have been blotted out, and they won't walk in the presence of the Lord, because if we give people the hope that everything gets made right in the end, they'll just run right now away from God. That's been the fear forever of people. And I can't change minds. I don't try to change minds. I just try to present the way I see it. If your mind changes, I think that's going to be at your own wrestling. But I would say this to that. Let's assume for a moment the broadest possible definition. We've already assumed the narrow one. Let's assume the broadest possible. That the restoration of all things really does mean that at the end, he pulls all in heaven and earth into himself. It doesn't exclude the fire of God. It wouldn't exclude that he's a consuming fire. It wouldn't exclude that he has to burn out of us the wood, hay, and the stubble. It wouldn't take any of that away. It also wouldn't exclude that you get to live the life of God now if you want it. That you can step into the abundant life that Jesus said he came to give you. And that you could get there if you'd change your mind about God and convert to his kingdom. That if you would do that now, you could step into it now. None of that gets excluded if apocatastasis means that in the end he restores all things. In other words... I can believe both things at the same time as far as I'm concerned. I can believe that God restores everything and everyone in both heaven and earth into himself and that if it takes him an eternity to do it, he does it because he doesn't have a watch on. And still believe that you ought to change your mind about God and receive forgiveness of sins because the best way to live is to live the life of God now. 
I can still believe both of those things at the same time and believe them with all my heart and believe very much that you should come to Christ because he is life and life more abundant. And still believe, even if it's with my fingers crossed and my eyes squinting and just hoping, that apocatastasis means he literally brings everybody home. So I don't know that we have to fight about it, but we will. <laughs> because it's the only way we know to deal with these issues, is to just say, well, I don't believe that at all. It, it's interesting to me that I've had things in my life that I thought, I, I can't be convinced of this. This is the way I feel. And then I had the Holy Spirit work on me and change my mind on them. And so I gave up this idea that I've got everything right a long time ago. And I don't claim to have figured things out. So my metric is no longer I got to be right. My faith isn't built on being right. But I believe in a good God. And I believe he looks just like Jesus. And so the more impressed I become with the cross as God's way of taking everything wrong with the system and putting it into the body of Christ, and then the more I become persuaded that he actually resurrected as a new man, the easier it is for me to think that apocatastasis just might be bigger than I could have ever imagined. And that's enough for me. At least that's a good spot for me to be now. That's to say, it, maybe it's just bigger than I realize. Maybe it never got used again in the New Testament because it's so big. I don't know. You, you would think they would use it 20 or 30 or 40 times. Maybe Paul would come back to the word over and over again. He never does. Uh, or maybe it is just that Peter used a word that seemed like it would work in that spot and we've overthought it. It's possible too. But I like it anyway. I like a word that sums up the gospel message in one thought. But in the end, he puts everything back where it's supposed to be. He's the great cleaner. He walks into this chaos. He takes all of it into himself. He recycles it. He cleans it off. He cleans it out, however long that takes him. And in our world, it takes three days. And he comes out of the grave as a brand new Adam. And he's done. He finished the work. No more questions about what about everybody that died before the cross? Doesn't matter. No, he's already stepped into time. He pulled them all into himself. So everything in him, he just put it all in him and took him however long that takes. But it took three days on our calendar. And maybe the process of pulling all of humanity through that keyhole of the cross is just way beyond my ability to comprehend or to think. And maybe that's what apocatastasis means, but whatever it is, I'm excited that in the end, he restores all things. And I don't divorce it from eschatology. It's one of the reasons why when people say, do you believe everything in the Bible's been fulfilled? My response now is, well, not yet on our timeline it hasn't, but it has in him, because in him, he is the restorer of all things. But I haven't seen all things made new. so. I still believe there's things to be done. They're just going to manifest themselves out in our world. I believe in apocatastasis. I believe he restores all things. I can't tell you exactly what that looks like. I can't tell you exactly how he's going to do it. I don't know for sure who all gets involved. I'm really hopeful that all of the texts in the New Testament that sound like an apocatastasis verse mean exactly what they sound like they mean. I'm really hopeful of that. But either way, I trust in Jesus, the resurrected Lord, and thank God that you get to live his life and you get to start now. You might say, well, I don't know any more than I knew when we started, other than there's a bunch of different ways to think about things. Well, good, because sometimes people don't even know there's more than one way to think about anything. So if you leave going, oh, well, there's four or five ways I could think about that. Well, then maybe we're four or five ways farther along, and that's a good thing too. Let the wrestling begin. Let's pray. Father, I hope tonight that we have done justice in some way to the text that Peter gave, the restoration of all things. I don't know what it looks like, but I do believe it's coming because I do believe in Jesus, who the book of Revelation has saying, behold, I make all things new. 
Well, if you're going to make all things new, I hope you'll start with me. Make all things new in me. Make all things new for me. And I know that this doesn't happen on my watch, my clock. It happens on yours in a space where there is no clock. However long that takes you, Father, I am hopeful for the restoration of all things me. Even greater, I'm hopeful for the restoration of all things for everyone here, for everyone watching, for everyone listening, for everyone who hates you, for everyone who doesn't believe in you, for everyone who rejects you, for everyone who mocks you, for everyone who doubts you are real. I am not praying vengeance. That would be the way of those who killed you. I'm praying restoration of all things, apocatastasis, in Jesus' name, amen.